Thank you for joining us for the first webinar of the National Invasive Species Awareness Week 2020 webinar series. Today's webinar is on preventing aquatic invasive species through the National Clean Drain Dry Program. I will start us off by providing a brief introduction to the Clean Drain Dry Program and the steps the Canadian Council has taken to build and expand the program, as well as the tools and resources available to your organization. Kristen, Kristen Elton, the coordinator of the New Brunswick Invasive Species Council is joining us today and will provide us with her learnings and challenges that she's had during the implementation of the Clean Drain Dry Program in New Brunswick. To start us off, I'm gonna provide a little bit of background on the Clean Drain Dry Program. All right, the Canadian Council on the Invasive Species or CCIS is a federally registered nonprofit organization which serves as a national coordinated voice and hub to protect Canada from the impacts of invasive species. Created as a result of a Canada-wide Canada call for a strong national and inclusive organization that serves as a voice to connect provincial and territorial perspectives across the country since 2008, has focused on preventing the spread and introduction of invasive species into and across Canada through key priority pathways of spread. Today, the CCIS is guided by a four chamber board of directors along with various working groups whose directors and members include federal and provincial territorial governments, indigenous organizations, industry, and invasive species organizations from across Canada. You can see some of these organizations on the slide in front of you. So as mentioned, our focus is on pathways of spread. When we are proactive and we prevent invasive species introduction and movement, we minimize future impacts and higher costs for everyone. The CCIS has developed programs and resources related to pathways, including firewood movement, forestry, horticulture, pet aquarium trade, terrestrial recreation, and aquatic recreation, such as the Clean Drain Drive program we'll be discussing today. We are working to continue and expand the focus of our pathways programs as we continue to grow. For example, we're hoping to move into pathways, including transportation. Through these programs, we aim to connect groups across the country to improve coordination, reduce duplication of resources, facilitate knowledge sharing, and assist with capacity building. To promote these programs and support our mission, we also host education and information sharing events assist invasive species councils to become more established, as well as improve coordination across our borders through partnerships with organizations outside of Canada. So the Clean Drain Dry program is a national campaign that is a call to action to empower recreational users of aquatic resources to help stop the spread of harmful aquatic invasive, sp invasive species through changes in behavior. To initiate this program, the Canadian Council received funding from Fisheries and Oceans Canada in 2018 to launch a Clean Drain Drive program in British Columbia as the foundation of a national program. The project aims to encourage boaters, aqu aquatic recreationists, fishers, and anglers who play a critical role in protecting local watersheds from invasive species to clean drain dry all boats, equipment, and gear. A working group was also formed with advisors from across Canada to help guide the direction of the pilot project. Over the course of the three-year project, we've created an online hub for clean drain dry information, clean drain dry signage, and a social and digital media campaign, including videos and public service announcements. To further the pilot project's goals of establishing the foundation for a national campaign, we have created a partner program which, where groups can sign up and receive access to all of the resources created and to tailor them to suit their own unique needs as well. For those interested in becoming a partner of the program, there are various levels, including a supporter level, a level one and a level two, which give you access to different benefits of the program. So the goal of the supporter level is to encourage individuals to personally adopt a behavior change program um, these supporters are individuals who pledge to adopt Clean Drain Dry and also serve as a role model to encourage other organizations or people to join. Level one and level two are meant for organizations looking to implement Clean Drain Dry in their region. The main difference between the two levels is that level two receives two free hours of graphic design services from the Canadian Council on Invasive Species. 
Although we do not have dedicated funding to continuously add resources as we grow and partners, our, resources library, our resource library will also grow. Um, when, we new, when new partners sign up, they create their own resources or they tailor existing one, it just further builds our, our resource library. Also, when new partners join, it also further supports the sustainability of the program and its capacity for program development. In the next few weeks, we are planning to review the partner levels and make any needed adjustments. So we're actually wondering if you have any suggestions for us, please type them in the chat box and let us know. All right, and then for current resources for this program, our resources are available on the Clean Drain Dry website, so cleandraindry.ca, and they're available as is for download. We can find also also find out more about the partner program and you can also pledge to Clean Drain Dry. Um, some resources have also been translated and made bilingual, so if you have any further questions about the bilingual resources, please reach out to Kelly or myself. So, to introduce our second half, the main portion of, us, of this webinar, we have Kristen Elton from the New Brunswick Invasive Species Council, and she'll be talking about the implementation of the Clean Drain Drive program at the provincial level. So Kristen Elton is the project coordinator for the New Brunswick Invasive Species Council. Originally from Collingwood, Ontario, she grew up in the outdoors, loving nature and wildlife. Her background, her academic background focused on exploring the intersection of people, policy and the environment with a BA in environmental governments and are from the University of Guelph and a master's in environmental studies and planning from the University of Waterloo. She has extensive experience delivering environmental outreach and education programs in her roles with various nonprofit organizations in both Ontario and New Brunswick. Kristen joined the New Brunswick Invasive Species Council in August 2019, where she works with government and NGO partners to implement the Clean Drain Drive program, build capacity amongst stakeholders, and starting in 2020 is initiating the Buy Local Burn Local program, the Play Clean Go program, and a Don't Let It Loose program. Kristen is joining us today from Fredericton. All right, hi everybody. Um, so as I, uh, Gabby mentioned, my name is Kristen um, and I'm gonna be going through our experience here in New Brunswick of implementing um, Clean Drain Dry here in the province. So we'll just dive right in. I first wanna give you a little bit of um, context. Oh, my slide seems to be freezing. There we go. Um, about New Brunswick, for those who, who aren't familiar, um, we are a fairly small uh, province in terms of population, only about 780,000 people. Um, to put that in perspective, it's about the same as Mississauga. Um, keep in mind that Mississauga is growing and New Brunswick really is not that quickly. Um, we're quite rural. Only about half of our population is in major urban centers, which would be Fredericton, St. John down in the Bay of Fundy, and, and Moncton. Um, compare that to the natural, or sorry, the, the national average of around 80, um, and most of our people um, are, are spread out and uh, much more rural than, than the average Canadian. Um, also important to know that we are the only bilingual province, so um, this was a learning thing for me when I first moved to New Brunswick. I always assumed all provinces were bilingual, given that Canada uh, has two official languages. But at the provincial level, um, only New Brunswick requires both services in English and French. Um, about two thirds of the population is Anglophone, one third is Francophone, and then um, a third consider themselves bilingual to some degree uh, within that pop, uh, population. The other thing about us is that we're pretty old <laughs> um, in terms of our population, where average median age is around 46 years. The, we're the second oldest uh, population next to Newfoundland, and the national average is 40, I believe. Um, so generally an older population. Um, in terms of geography, oops, sorry. <laughs> in terms of geography, a heavily forested area, uh, most of the province is, is covered in deciduous, uh, deciduous or boreal mixed wood forest. We've got some of the Appalachian mountain range up in the north, uh, beautiful, magnificent Bay of Fundy down in the south, coastal plains, and in relation to Clean Drain Dry, two major river systems, one of which is the St. John River, which originates in Maine 
goes north towards the top of New Brunswick and comes back down through St. John into the Bay of Fundy. And the other is the Miramichi, which starts in the middle of the province and drains into the North Humberland Strait. On the economy side of things, very natural resource dependent. Um, here I've manufacturing listed as, as higher, but that manufacturing category actually includes um, paper processing, um, uh, seafood processing plants. So really about 15% of the province's GDP comes from that primary resource sector. Tourism is about 1.7%, but it's growing. The province just came out uh, with a new tourism economy strategy with the goal of increasing tourism expenditures by 57% by 2025. So they're really building New Brunswick and promoting it as a destination. Um, and it, it is an absolutely beautiful province. Um, so it's truly worthy. Right now, um, the joke is that it's a drive-through province and that most people are go through New Brunswick, but only to get to Prince Edward Island or Nova Scotia or in the opposite direction to get to Quebec and Ontario. Um, but there's a lot to, to love here and amazing environments for people to enjoy. The other key thing is that there's not a lot of inter no international hubs. So uh, use the airports as, a, as an indicator of this. We've got Fredericton as the capital of the province um, and we have just surpassed 400,000 passengers per year. To give you some perspective on that, um, I mean, Toronto Pearson has 49 million. Um, uh, Kelowna Airport out in BC is, on, is 2 million people. Ottawa is 5 million. Um, so, so quite small. We don't have a lot of uh, international traffic, even though they are international airports, um, which does have implications for actually protecting the province from the possibility of invasive species introduction from shipping um, and, and those type of vectors. The joke kind of going around New Brunswick right now um, kind of has to do with COVID-19 and how we're doing um, as a province we're doing quite well we've had low numbers uh, really good quote out of a CBC article by a reporter Jacques Poitois who says we're small we're rural we're old and we're spread out um, and I would add that we're also broke <laughs> to some extent because we do have so few people there's less tax money to be able to do things um, but in the same ways that it's been a, a beneficial for managing um, COVID-19, it's also probably been a benefit in terms of um, preventing invasive species introduction and spread. So with regard to invasive species, historically there hasn't been a lot of attention paid here in New Brunswick. They've either gone unnoticed or were established a long time ago. Um, we've got some of the common ones, you know, people releasing goldfish into their uh, river system. We've got um, some largemouth, smallmouth bass, which are invasive out here in the Atlantic. Purple loose strife, garlic, uh, garlic mustard on the marine side, green crab, glossy buckthorn, uh, Chinese mystery snail, um, everyone's favorite Japanese knotweed that nobody can seem to control. Uh, but more recently, we've seen this increase in interest around invasive species issues. And the reason for that could be varied. We have some local research happening um, by researchers on invasive species. There's a few groups who have a vested interest. Uh, there's more recognition and incorporation of policy at, for invasives at the national and global scale. Um, but what I think is really helping move this issue forward in the province is that we've had a few uh, high profile species be introduced. So, we have a couple spots of giant hogweed, um, Phragmites in a few places, but nowhere near the extent of Ontario and Quebec. Um, interestingly enough, they don't seem to grow as tall here, but they are just as prolific. Um, Eurasian water milfoil was recently detected in the St. John River in 2015, I believe. And then, of course, everyone's favorite little bug, the emerald ash borer, which has now been uh, confirmed in three regions in the province. So with having these kind of high profile species, it's brought this issue to the forefront. And a really good example of this is we had a, a newspaper reporter reach out to us at the end of 2019 because they were doing kind of a summary of the news stories. And he noticed that there was a lot of stories about invasive species. And he said, why are we getting all these invasive species all of a sudden? And it's not a matter that we're just getting them. It's a matter that we're noticing them now. They're on our radar. Um, and they, they have become a topical issue, but they've always been here. 
With regards to regulation and management, it's very minimal here in the province. Um, we do not have any provincial invasive species legislation like in Ontario. There's no list of prohibited or regulated species. Um, we do have some legislation that applies, such as uh, measures within our environmental assessment process that triggers if someone's wanting to bring non-natives into the province, or also with the Federal Fisheries Act um, in terms of transporting non-native species. But here at the provincial level, no one, no department is mandated the responsibility of dealing with invasives. Um, that doesn't mean the departments don't deal with them. Um, they do, but generally only with respect to their mandates. So for example, the Department of Natural Resources and Energy Development has a mandate to protect biodiversity. Invasives are a threat to that. So they manage invasives within that context. Agriculture and aquaculture departments, their mandate is to you know, create sustainable industry in those fields. Invasives can impact that. So they work on invasives from that angle. Um, but for most of this and most people, Invasive species are a side of desk issue that get dealt with when there's time. Um, now, Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada does have an official mandate to manage aquatic invasive species across the country. Um, and in some provinces, the provincial counterparts have taken on the responsibility of actually um, the, the actions and the management of that responsibility. But the delegation here in New Brunswick um, is still being sorted out. So those roles are still uh, need to be ironed out moving forward. So overall there's there's quite a few gaps that we could that need to be addressed. I should also mention that there's a lot of um, groups doing individual individual work uh, such as the Nature Trust of New Brunswick, Nature Conservancy of Canada, New Brunswick Alliance of Lake Associations who have um, they're working on it they're concerned about invasive species and they've uh, taken on some initiatives themselves such as um, and monitoring programs or um, removals. So, but overall things are quite piecemealed here in the province. Um, so that brings me to the New Brunswick Invasive Species Council. We originally kind of got together in 2009. We consist of stakeholders from government and various nonprofit groups. Um, brought to, you know, this kind of brought to the forefront with funding that was available from the federal government for invasive species issues. Uh, fast forward to 2013, funding and momentum had kind of died out. It didn't, there wasn't really a big appetite in the province. Um, you know, it wasn't the number one issue. It wasn't pressing. Um, periodic meetings continued with interested parties, uh, just more keeping people up to date on what was happening, but uh, really no, no active management or, or outreach. In 2018, um, the council was kind of reignited with the help of CCIS. Uh, in response to increased interest and concern about invasives in the province. There was a few ind determined individuals uh, who made this happen, um, wanting to see change, really helping to drive this forward. And, and as a result, funding was applied for um, by CCIS on our behalf, which we were successful in receiving. So once we figured out that, yes, we need this council, we need to be doing work here, it was a matter of where do we start? Um, there's lots of options, lots of room for improvement. Uh, what's, what, what should we be focusing on? And changing regulatory frameworks and management structure takes time. So the question is, what could we do right now to address the problem? And that is addressing the actual spread of the invasive species. And it was identified that there's very little outreach and education around this issue in the province. So it was decided to start Clean Drain Dry. Now out of all the programs, why did we go with Clean Drain Dry? A um, couple of reasons. First, uh, we had special concern about aquatic species in general from various stakeholders. Um, in particular, the MBALA, the Alliance of Lake Associations, and St. John River were particularly concerned with Eurasian water milfoil that had been identified. Um, the Canadian Rivers Institute, or CRI, uh, assisted them, and there's a researcher there, Dr. Megan Bruce, who's doing a lot of work on, on that plant. Um, they had, in the previous year, worked with CCIS to create boat launch signs, um, educational signs that, that were installed. So we wanted to build on that momentum that was already occurring. Um, we had the arrival of Eurasian water milfoil, uh, which was spreading throughout the St. John River, but is not currently in our lakes. So it provides the opportunity to kind of stop it where it is right now. 
And we also do not have zebra mussels or quagga mussels here in New Brunswick, despite the fact that the risk of invasion has been high based on um, you know, characteristics of, of water uh, parameters and that. But for some stroke of luck, we do not have zebra mussels that we know of, and we sure want to keep it that way. So um, this, this program really defectively relates to that. And in addition to that, there are a few species at risk, aquatic species, at risk um, that would be impacted by zebra and quagga mussels. So um, the, the clean drain dry just made sense. And then from a pragmatic standpoint, clean drain dry resources were already being developed and had been beta tested or, or piloted by CCIS with the Invasive Species Council in New Brunswick, or sorry, in BC. Um, so we didn't have to start from the ground up. As a new group with you know minimal people, minimal funds, you know, we didn't want to have to start from scratch, so this was a low-hanging fruit. So the Clean Drain Dry in New Brunswick. Um, Clean Drain Dry is a behavioral change program that I'm sure many of you have heard of or have at least heard of one of the similar programs. Um, we've got a Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers, Pull the Plug. My personal favorite is Don't Move a Muscle, and I love Nebraska's little, little bandit muscle there in their logo. Um, all of these programs are getting at the exact same principle. The idea that everybody, boaters, any recreational water users, um, need to clean, drain, and dry their boats, trailers, and equipment before moving water bodies um, to stop the spread. And it's a behavioral change program, which means we're going beyond awareness. We don't just want to let people know about the issues. We actually want to inspire them to take these changes. Um, it's based on community-based social marketing, which really focuses on identifying and removing the barriers that are in place that prevent people from making those changes. So those steps, what are we asking people to do? It's a call to action, as most behavioral change programs are. So first step we're asking is to clean all plants, animals, mud from your boat. You pull your trailer out of, you know, out of the water, getting underneath, checking, make sure you haven't pulled out a clump of weeds that are stuck on one of the crossbars, um, doing a visual inspection, draining all the water from your boat, internal compartments, ballast, live wells, bilge, um, not only because it uh, is important for preventing invasive species, but it's also illegal to transport plugged watercraft in some provinces and US states for that reason. And then also drying all parts of the boat and the the gear completely. And the reason for the drain and the dry is because there's invasive species um, that can you can't see. So for example, invasive zebra mussels, their larva is too small to see with the naked eye. So you can look in a bucket of water and say, oh, there's nothing there. It's fine. Um, but really there is, and you just end up spreading it when you move. So um, especially with the drawing, getting in there, drying out all the places, water pools. All right, so how did we do this in New Brunswick? First step was funding, everybody's favorite swear word in the nonprofit sector. Um, as I mentioned, uh, MBISC as, an, as a new group, we are acting as a chapter of CCIS and CCIS has provided us assistance um, with administrative stuff, with um, uh, applying for grants on our behalf. And we, we were successful in getting three in, um, environmental grants, two from the provincial government and um, one from the Federal Habitat Stewardship Program, which aims to support priorities and activities uh, that benefit species at risk, of which I mentioned we have two here, and our, our program specifically focuses on the brook floater um, and the yellow lamp mussel, both freshwater um, mussels that would be impacted by uh, in the, uh, zebra mussels and other invasive aquatic species. So the next step, Diverse stakeholder engagement. And I want to emphasize that this isn't, this is actually engaging them in the program planning and the program implementation. Um, it never really ends. It shouldn't end. This is an ongoing process. Um, but really, when you're setting up, this is a really good place to start. I want to emphasize as well the diverse component of this. Um, I'm still coming up with uh, people or groups that I think, oh, yeah, they would be involved as well, or they would have an interest. The list goes on and on. Um, you figure out, you get the lay of the land. Who could potentially have some interest in this issue? 
For us, we've got different government departments. We've got user groups like anglers, uh, canoers, kayakers, um, boaters. We've got municipalities who uh, are responsible for beaches and water quality, nonprofit environmental groups, a whole host um, of different people who might have a concern for this issue. Now, the next step, once you've identified who's who, you want to figure out what activities are currently underway, what's already happening, who's involved, and who might be missing that you could bring into the fold. Um, another important part is identifying who the main contact in the various government departments would be, um, or should be in the case if, if it hasn't already been identified. Um, the other thing is assessing your strengths and opportunities and obstacles. So identifying each stakeholder's expertise. What is their niche? So um, is, are you, is there a group that's you know, particularly um, good and motivated to do some lobbying with the governments to try and get more uh, management frameworks in place? Um, you know, do you have a local invasive species expert who's willing to work with you? Is somebody on your team you know, really adept at graphic design and can help with the program? Uh, identify those areas and start there. Then figure out what do the groups need in order to actually help with this Clean Drain Dry program. So a lot of people have a desire to be a part um, of something, but they don't have the funds for it. They don't have the manpower. Um, they don't have the knowledge or the skill set, you know, if it were to come to, for management. So identifying what, um, what those groups need. And then identifying if there's an easy place to start. So, I mean, if somebody in this circle that you've created um, happens to be a part of a local fishing club, that's an easy way to begin your outreach. Try and connect with that club. You know, they can bring you in for a night, talk to their members. That's your first step and you grow from there. The other part is learning to speak your stakeholders language. And I mean this literally um, on one hand in terms of things like terminology, um, you know, what what are they actually talking about? For, in my case, I learned that you refer to people who fish recreationally as anglers, not fishermen. Um, I've learned the parts of a boat that I never knew about before. It helps you have those conversations. Um, the other thing is to figure out where your stakeholders are coming from on the issue. It could be a different perspective than yours, and you need to figure out how you can frame discussions around that interest of theirs or their perspective. Um, I put this fact up here because I think it really exemplifies uh, kind of this multi kind of a, a bigger um, challenge to managing invasive species in that recreational anglers, they spent over $1.6 billion um, in the local uh, in the local towns uh, where they're going and doing fishing. Um, so you know, if you're talking to somebody and you want to put it in a measure, say, with regards to the smallmouth bass, which are invasive, uh, technically, in, in, um, in some areas, um, depending on where you are in Canada, for us, for us, it is, if you were to put in measures to try and say, stop um, uh, bass fishing tournaments, on one hand, you're going to get pushed back because people want to fish bass. Um, but you're also going to get pushed back from the towns who benefit economically from those, uh, from those tournament. So you have to understand why somebody might be concerned about this. Uh, the other thing you need to know is being up front when you know you're not the expert. When I walked into this bass fishing community, I was, I recognized that I knew very, very little. Um, I used to catch maybe tiny little sunfish. I have memories of my dad getting a fish hook stuck in his finger as a child, but that's kind of the extent of where my fishing and angling experience ends. Um, so I yield to their expertise. The other thing is recognizing the importance of different opinions and experiences and acknowledging the contribution and unique perspectives. So a couple examples that I've experienced here with working, we have a pretty good working relationship with um, some of the Bass Fishing Association. And a lot of people will say, well, they're invasive in New Brunswick, why are you working with them? Well, you know what, they have, you know, they're the ones who are moving boats. So they are part of, um, you know, they are a potential vector. So in increasing engagement with them and focusing engagement is good, but also they're the ones who are out on the water all the time. They're seeing changes over time as year after year, they go to the same places that they like to fish and they witness these water bodies changing. 
Um, so they have a wealth of knowledge that is not available uh, to myself or other people involved in the project. And, you know, they also are the ones who are going to be out there spending way more time and are more likely to notice uh, an invasive species um, and be able to and be able to report that. Um, the other example that I, I find is funny is one time we had, you know, we were trying to figure out, okay, what, what's the process for putting boat launch signs on crown land? And, you know, there's a couple of government people there, nonprofit, and we're bouncing back and forth. Okay, how could we figure this out? What are the rules? Who should we contact? And we had uh, uh, a man named Larry from the New Brunswick uh, Alliance or Sport Fishing Association, and he just said, well, why don't you just get in touch with the snowmobile groups? Because they have put signs on crown lands all over the province. And it was like, it was kind of silence and then an aha moment. Everybody quickly scribbled down the idea. It was just something we had never thought about, but he brought that knowledge to the table and that new perspective. Um, also be prepared for some healthy debate. Sometimes you're gonna have differing opinions and you have to, have to know how to uh, tactfully deal with that. Um, so our outreach and public engagement we're emphasizing two key messages with the public. The first is that prevention is easier and more effective than dealing with invasive species once they're here. And then the other is that, why should these people care in the first place? So when it comes to the first message about prevention, many of us are familiar with this graph um, with regards to invasive species. Sometimes scientists and environmental managers, we tend to dive into terminology and explanations and kind of get lost in our own little world. This is not a very good outreach tool for people. You gotta to talk to them in the way that they're gonna, they're gonna understand that's gonna resonate with them. So we say that invasive species management is timely and labor intensive. It's costly. Uh, for reference, that's uh, helicopters dealing with feral pigs. Um, and then sometimes it's just not super effective. So as tasty as lionfish is, and I can attest it is very tasty, um, not all invasive species are tasty and you would probably have to eat a whole heck of a lot of them in order to actually make a dent. So, you know, put it in terms that people get. Um, then we think about why they should care and really drive home the impacts to the environment, the economy, recreation, and human health. Know your audience and know which one of those things is going to resonate with them. Um, and then show them the impacts of that. I can't emphasize enough um, the importance of being able to visually depict um, what invasive species do. This is a really good example by um, pictures taken by Dr. Megan Bruce of what Eurasian water milfoil does um, to, to water bodies. This is uh, within the St. John um, River watershed. Um, over three years, we went from a you know, place you could swim and snorkel um, and with clear water to, you know, not being able to get a kayak through with covered in algae. So, you know, visual representations like this definitely do the trick. You can also add a little humor, um, because it at least grabs their attention. Um, and then you can start the conversation from there. You know, you, it doesn't have to be serious right off the bat. Just how do you connect with somebody on this issue and then go from there. So what have we been doing specifically? Well, first is targeted user group engagement. So identifying which of those user groups um, would be at risk of spreading invasive species through their activities and reaching out to them. So we've been doing, um, we've attended angling tournaments where we've helped with assessing uh, if, you know, checking people's boats coming off the water, if they've got any debris on them. There's a picture of me in the bottom there. I've grabbed some Eurasian water milfoil off a boat um, you know, we've gone to AGMs and had information booths at uh, canoe and kayak symposiums. We had intended on going to the New Brunswick Sport Fishing, or sorry, Sportsman Show and Moncton Boat Show in March, but that got uh, sidelined by COVID-19. But um, having information booths where people are going to see. Um, we've done presentations as well, uh, yacht club, um, fish and wildlife clubs, even the, the high school grade 10 science class. And that the end options for this are endless. We've got tubing companies that you know do tubing down the river in the summer, canoe rentals, fishing lodges, you know, the list goes on and on of who you can engage with. The other thing is our boat launch sign. So this was an initiative that was started in 20.
2018 by the New Brunswick Alliance of Lake Associations, St. John River Society, and Canadian Rivers Institute uh, around concern for Eurasian water milfoil. So they worked with CCIS to develop the first iteration of our clean, drain, dry sign. Um, and they were installed and they act as an in-place reminder right where they should be doing the steps that they need to clean, drain, and dry. Um, it's a visual reminder, it's an education tool, and it also adds a little element of, um, uh, we'll say peer pressure, because if somebody drives off and completely ignores that sign, doesn't stop, you know, others may have a specific opinion about that within the community. Um, so what we've done with our funding this year is we actually wrote into our grants that uh, to get funding so we could contract stakeholder groups around the province to install these signs. So we've had the signs printed, um, we provide the materials, and the groups are just the ones going out and actually doing the installation. Um, that's twofold reason. One, we can't be everywhere. I, uh, you know, we're a spread out province, um, so this is an efficient way to do it, but it also engages those groups around the province. Um, we've got some general public outreach, press releases, media engagement, social media, and then we also have our promotional materials with the product or with the program logo on it. Um, we've got a, a clean, drain, dry, dry bag, some floating keychains. Uh, we've got you know, you know waterproof decals that can go on the trailer hitch, um, so they're right there when people are using it. And all of this is just to get people to change their behavior to. to um, to take on that responsibility and recognize their role in prevention of invasive species. So we, we also have a take the pledge, which Gabby had mentioned. Um, you know, it, it's one step beyond just somebody saying, yeah, I'll clean, drain, dry my boat by, you know, writing a signature down on pen and paper or online as we also have. It just adds an, another element of accountability. So the the resources that we've used, um, we adapted existing resources. We've also created a few new ones. We did create more in English and French um, because we are a bilingual province. Um, in adapting um, certain things to look out for, um, this rat card that we had, we used from BC and originally one of the species was a bullfrog. Um, and bullfrogs are invasive in BC, but they're native to New Brunswick, so you know, Double checking those things before you just move along. Um, educational materials, we've got, we also have an interactive iPad display being created to take to events as just another medium, kind of a self guided journey through this information. Um, program swag as reminders. And one of the things with this is that we've steered away from things like magnets and buttons on the advice of Ken Donnelly, who does a lot of work around behavioral change programs. Um, because you, you want people to be reminded of needing to do clean, drain, dry when they are by their boats and their trailers. And as nice as a fridge magnet is, you don't need to be reminded to clean your boat when you're walking through your kitchen and you pass your fridge. So within that mindset, we have tried to kind of, you know, pick the swag items with the logo on it that relate to, to the program. And I'm pretty excited about the chamois cloth that we have coming in because it actually those are helping to facilitate one of that dry step of the process. So these are boat launch signs. Um, we did do a few new new versions just based on some feedback. We did a larger a larger version that actually indicates where people should be looking on boats to be putting up the larger boat launches, but then also a more general sign that we can install in places where people are launching kayaks, where people are fly fishing, areas where you wouldn't necessarily, it's not actually a boat launch, but people are still at risk of transferring invasive species and need to take those clean, drain, dry steps. I also cannot underestimate or understate the uh, value of having example specimens and images um, of these impacts. So we were able to get our hands on Chinese mystery snail, which you see in the larger jar in the photo there, some quagga mussels, um, really good for indicating to people the size of them. We've got some Eurasian water our milfoil, um, courtesy of, of Megan, Megan Bruce. If you're in an area with it, the double-edged sword is that if you need to show somebody, you can usually just walk down to the water and grab some more. Um, but also having, you know, print off a photo of zebra mussels clogging a motor or a pipe, stick it to some cardstock and have it at your event with you. It's just way easier to show people 
picture is worth a thousand words. This picture in particular will always elicit a response. People are amazed at the impact and how quickly zebra mussels will colonize, and this will get people caring. So find things like this. So beyond the outreach um, and things that we're doing with the public, we also are working on capacity building. And the goal of this is to try and create a network of people collaborating on these efforts to share knowledge, skills, resources, to effectively manage the threat of aquatic invasives in New Brunswick. We want to do this by partnering with groups um, to deliver clean, drain, dry messaging on our behalf, whether it's providing them with the funding, if they can have staff, um, providing those resources and materials so that people can distribute them to their groups, facilitating knowledge development like aquatic um, invasive species ID workshops, and working behind the scenes to try and advance management and invasive reporting in our province because we are really lacking um, in that governance structure that we need. Um, so we actually have a student through the Masters of Environmental Management program who's working with us to do a jurisdictional review of uh, other provinces and, and states to look at what we can um, what we can implement here. So this train the trainer workshop, the purpose was to teach others how to teach others to identify uh, Eurasian water milfoil and zebra mussels. And Dr. Megan Bruce partnered with us um, and she came in, did a great presentation. Um, she brought in samples of both the invasive kind of milfoil and the native kind so people could really see um, the difference. And, and then we also provided them with present the presentation so that they could go back to their networks and teach others. And the idea behind this is that you're creating a cascade of new experts and eyes on the water. So overall, some of the successes that we've had with this program, the stakeholder involvement has been fantastic. We've had a lot of really determined individuals with appetite for change. Um, few people to kind of mention that have really driven this home, Paul and Well at NCC, Uli Ehrlich, um, the New Brunswick Alliance of Lake Associations, and Dr. Megan Bruce and the uh, St. John River Society. Everyone has just been very, very involved. Um, it's also been helpful that New Brunswick is so small a population because it's a close network and it's easily identified. Um, in most, in a lot of cases, you meet somebody uh, for this project and it turns out you know them through something else um, or you've talked with them about a previous issue and you can easily identify who you need to bring in to involve because say in Ontario where you've got multiple departments with different people in different roles, uh, multiple roles, you know, it's kind of hard to figure out that network. Here in New Brunswick, because there's so few of us, it's really easy to know who you need to call. Um, having local expertise uh, on a species of concern, the Eurasian water milfoil with Dr. Bruce was um, really helpful. Um, being the only group that is really doing invasive species here, um, I mean, it's unfortunate, it, but also it means that we we were kind of a new we're providing a new um, outreach no competition or minimal competition for funds on that sense and then also the fact that we have in uh, zebra mussel invasions elsewhere um, provides a really good example uh, to people it's a really clear demonstration of why preventing them is important because it's really easy to brush off somebody's concern if there's kind of uncertainty around what would happen but when you show them hey this is what's happening in the Great Lakes this is what's happening out west we don't want this to happen here they very very quickly come on board and it really works for demonstrating the importance of this clean drain dry program some of our challenges um, long-term funding and longevity planning it's just because most of our funding grants are year to year, which makes it hard to, to plan for down the road. I mean, we, we have ideas, it's just we can't really get work on them until we are sure we have the capacity to do it. French translation has been a bit of an issue just because um, there's colloquial differences between regions. Um, so it's taken a lot of time to make sure that we're getting that right. Um, I will admit that we've gotten it wrong in some cases and had to, um, you know, readjust things. Um, but, you know, it just, took a little bit more time to do our resources. And our engagement with the Francophone community, um, unfortunately we don't have anyone who is bilingual who can speak to the program, which really limits our outreach um, to, to the French community. For example, we had a, a radio, a French radio station ask us for an interview, but unfortunately we, we couldn't do it, but we could provide them. We worked with a translator and was able to provide them some written notes. 
Um, and then finally, staying within our capacity. You know, we want to help increase capacity around the province, but you know, within our organization, we've got one staff member, myself, um, some pretty dedicated people, you know, helping me out, but there's so many things we could be doing. Picking where we're going to put our, our uh, efforts and our interests has been hard um, and making sure we don't overextend ourselves. And for me, that's a personal challenge because I get very gung ho about initiatives. So I want to dive right in, but I, I have to always make sure that I know, you know, there's only going to be one or two of us. How much can we actually get done? So finally, I just want to leave you with some tips um, based on my experience, one of which cater to your strengths. Like I said, um, you know, it's easy to get started and with something you already know how to do. Um, be open to conversations and build genuine relationships with people. Um, you know, it breaks down barriers. Um, it, it, it makes it easier. It solidifies those relationships. It's also just a really nice thing to do. Um, acknowledge that you're an outsider when you're a community coming into a community, you know, whether it's anglers or hunters or rock climbers and telling them to change, that's not going to go over well, but approaching it as if you want to work with them, um, to benefit both of you on this issue, rather than just telling them what to do, uh, and being upfront about that, you're going to, you're going to be much better received. Um, take some time to learn about about those communities you're engaging with. You know, I've learned so much about bass fishing in the last nine months um, that I, I never knew I would ever become interested in, but it's just, there's so much you can learn and just always leave time to do that. Um, use existing resources where possible, you know, reach out to others. Likely somebody has what you need and is more than happy to share it or help you adapt it. It's, it's more efficient. Um, you know, there's no point in everybody reinventing the wheel or struggling to get off the ground when we could be working together. And then finally, um, expect to have some awkward conversations. You know, invasive species uh, can be a contentious issue because there are so many societal connotations along with them. There's different interests. Some people are going to be in a room who don't see eye to eye and you need to be able to mitigate that. Um, some people are going to dismiss your messaging and, and kind of laugh and shrug you off. But um, this is where, you know, honing your people skills really come in and always reminding yourself of where other people are coming from um, so that you can figure out, you know, what's the common ground and where can you go from there? So start there and move forward. But, you know, it, it, it can be awkward sometimes, but I, it, it has been, we've been really successful, I think, in, in, um, in moving through weird conversations like that. So um, with that, I'll uh, thank everybody. Um, I hope you guys found this informative. If anybody has any questions, feel free to contact me. And we also have our website at nbinvases.ca. Um, and I'll pass it back to Gabby. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kristen, for that informative presentation. There's some really great tips in there. I especially liked the one about not reinventing the wheel and using these kinds of presentations for other people to learn from. So I'm sure there's definitely some inspiration for others out there uh, for the Clean Drain Dry program. So we're gonna move into the Q&A section um, of the webinar. So if anyone would like to ask a question, if you could please submit it to the Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen, um, we'll be taking your questions now. Okay, so Ken Donnelly, right off the bat, he says, this is great. What is next for 2020 or in 2020? Hi, Ken. Um, so as, as I, I think Gabby might have briefly mentioned at the beginning, um, building on the success of Clean Drain Dry, uh, we want to continue that, um, reach out to more stakeholders. Um, we really have room to, to grow and improve with our outreach uh, with, with the francophone community so um, you know hopefully hiring a staff member um, who is able who's bilingual um, so that we can fill that need but um, we're looking to we've we've just secured funding to do three more programs um, the play clean go uh, and a terrestrial invasive species don't let it loose around um, responsible pet ownership and not releasing non-native um, invasives and buy local burn local around not moving firewood so uh, yeah, just based on how, how well this program was received and how many questions we've gotten from other organizations and stakeholders, you know, what about Emerald Ash Borer? What about Giant Hogweed? Um, 
we, it's, it's a good time. So we're, we're excited and we, we're, we're building momentum. Awesome. We also have a question from Doug. He says, great presentation. What about assessment? Any conducted, um, I'm sorry, conducted uh, measure level of awareness and behavior change? So have you conducted anything to kind of measure that change? Um, in being the first year, we haven't uh, conducted any assessment um, after the first year of the program. There was an assessment done around awareness um, with the Canadian Council um, previously that we are able to use as a benchmark. So um, the idea is that we will be able to uh, re readminister that survey, public survey of, of opinions and level of awareness a year or two down the road so that we can gauge, you know, has this, uh, has this program been successful? Awesome. Um, and then we have Colleen asking, are we able to obtain this information to spread the word, brochures, signs, etc.? cetera? Um, and I know Kelly might also want to jump in after you, Kristen, on this. Yeah, definitely. Um, we, we have rack cards available that I can, I can send to different groups. Um, if you've, you know, if you're going to be putting mailers in, you know, your cottage association, you want to put, uh, information in everybody's mailbox, we're happy to work with you on that. Um, so yes, there's definitely lots, lots of different resources available, uh, that we can provide and, and work with you on. And did Kelly have anything to add to that? Yeah, I'll just uh, jump in there and just say, um, if you're outside of New Brunswick, um, yeah, definitely. That's kind of uh, what Gabby was discussing at the beginning, the kind of overall national clean, drain, dry program that um, is being piloted in BC, but is being expanded across Canada. Canada and the idea is that it's um, kind of a sign-up program, kind of like New Brunswick has do done. And once you sign up as a partner, you can get access to the various already created resources and tailor them to your, your use. Um, so yeah, um, if you want more information on that, I don't know, well, you can go to our website, but also Gabby might put up her email again there. But yes, definitely outside of, well, within New Brunswick, Kristen kind of said how you can partner there, but then outside Canadian Council, our goal is to um, assist organizations across Canada in implementing these campaigns. Not necessarily to duplicate ones that already exist. We already recognize that some people in different provinces and territories might already be doing a bit different variation of clean and dry. So in no way do we want to um, replace those programs, but we want to supplement them where we can and also support, just like Kristen explained, um, organizations that might not necessarily have the resources to start off with, with developing these resources from scratch. The idea of the national program is that you can get access to those resources and then tailor them to, you, to suit your needs. Awesome, thanks. And we just have one last question here before we wrap up, um, and it's from Jill. Has your group been involved with the proposed removal of the smallmouth bass in the, I'm sorry if I messed this name up, but Miramichi Lake using Rotino? Um, I would love to get your thoughts on this, she says. Um, so that's a, that question has come up a lot. Um, no, we, we have not been involved um, in the proposal um, or in project planning for that. We are aware of it though um, and we have shared information on the project. Um, the, the interesting with that, with that is that uh, I mean it's, it's, a, it's a contentious issue. It's a, it's a real bundle of um, human dimensions um, going on there and, and how to navigate, navigate that. We're not taking, um, you know, because we haven't been involved in it, we can't like, you know, comment on, on the, the proposal or the plan, but the lesson that I take from it is that um, it is a great example of why, you know, public outreach and awareness campaigns like this are, are a benefit. Um, so, you know, it's one of the reasons why we want to do clean drain, or sorry, um, don't let it loose uh, moving forward, uh, because it is a topical issue here, here in New Brunswick. Um, it's also, you know, as, as convoluted of an issue it is, it's one of those things that's acting as, as a spark for in conversations around invasive species management here in the province. So a double-edged sword in that, you know, it's, it's not the greatest situation to be in, but it's, if we look at the bright side, at least it's helping get things moving. Awesome. 
Thanks, Kristen. So I want to say a big thank you for your presentation and sharing your learnings with us on behalf of the Canadian Council and everyone here today listening. So thanks so much for that. And this concludes the first webinar of the 2020 National Invasive Species Awareness Week webinar series. Remember to use hashtag NISA and hashtag invasive species on social media posts this week when you're promoting invasive species prevention in your region. So thank you all for joining and we hope to see you at the next one. Take care.